Okay, guys, so we're waiting around for uh, one more minute just before we start. Now, I am going to mention that unexpectedly in the lobby behind me, they're playing some sort of music um, and might be having a show. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys can't hear it, but if you can uh, and you need us to speak up, let us know this was not anticipated. <laughs> um, so if... Uh, uh, yeah, well, I guess it's one o'clock. Oh, so, okay, let's get started. Yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be looking at searching PubMed. We'll be looking at some of the basics plus some of the advanced features. I'm Angela Osterreicher with the WRHA Virtual Library, and this is Maureen Babb. I'm also with the WRHA Virtual Library. We are two out of your three librarians. Um, and it's a 30 minute session today. It will be recorded so that if you miss anything or you have to leave early, or if you want to share it with any of your yes, colleagues, you can do share. so. Um, we'll leave it up indefinitely. Yeah. And, uh, after this is done, we'll be sending out a survey to ask you how we did and feel free to ask any questions in that chat box right. that you have. Okay. Um, so in terms of what we're going to be uh, doing today. We'll start with a brief overview of who we are. Um, perhaps you've used our services before, uh, but we offer electronic resources, so databases access to online resources, as well as document delivery for any resources that we don't have direct access to, and this includes physical resources like books, um, which will be mailed directly to your place. Uh, we do literature searches upon request on any subject that you require a literature search on, and we do education and training sessions like Ooh. this one. Yeah, and that's our URL up there, so start, yeah. book, start bookmarking it. <laughs> um, so in terms of our page looks kind of like this, what you're seeing here is our contact page. Uh, so if you need to email us or book an appointment with any of us, uh, we're available for that. Um, this session itself will cover what is PubMed, uh, how to find it, how to use it. <laughs> um, so specific search techniques, including keyword, phrase searching, Boolean searching, and message subject headings. Um, we'll talk about some of the features, single citation matcher, filters, clipboard, and uh, history, like your, your history, not the history of PubMed. Um, and we'll do an example query on finding guidelines. Um, we'll talk about getting full text, uh, uh, full text of the articles, and we'll take a closer look at MeSH if we have time. Now, I see we have a question here. Uh, can we please have a slide deck of the presentation afterwards? Uh, yes, I will send out the slide deck as well as a link to where you can re-watch the presentation if you would like, and that will probably come out uh, on Friday or later today after the presentation. Okay. Thank and you. I'll pass to Angela for the next bit. Okay, so what is PubMed? It is a search engine found on the internet. It's developed by the U.S. National Library and the National Center for Biotechnology Information. So it covers medicine, nursing, dentistry, includes veterinary medicine, healthcare system, and the focus is on the U.S., as well as biomedical and preclinical uh, sciences. The last time I counted, there were 28 million citations included in this database. Uh, and it does contain the full text content from PubMed Central, which is a book repository and publisher websites. But besides those, you do need to be able to know how to navigate to the WRJ PubMed because we link to the full text resources uh, that, they've per that they've purchased for you. So how to do that, again, here's our URL. Uh, take a moment to note that down, bookmark it, or put it in your favorites. Uh, to navigate to PubMed, you come to our home page, and then you see the tabs along the top there. Uh, very briefly, they're get access, find information, services, help, contact information. Uh, further down at the bottom there, there are boxes with the exact same information in there. Uh, to get to PubMed, you click on find information, and when you do that, you get to online resources from the drop down box. So it's pretty simple. So you click on online resources and it brings you to this page. 
So this is all the resources that uh, we that have been subscribed to for the WRHA, or some of them are free resources, and they are in an A to Z list. You might want to check it out sometime if you haven't done so. Uh, we have some great resources there, like Up to Date, which is a uh, at bedside clinical tool. Uh, we also have CINAHL, which is a nursing and allied health database. Uh, we have uh, several ebook collections for clinical resources as well as nursing resources. Uh, we have pharmacy information like RXTX as well. So since PubMed is so popular, what we've done is we put a little button off to the right there where the arrow is to make it easy for you to access. So that's how you navigate to PubMed. When you click on that, you will be asked to authenticate. Uh, they want to make sure that you're authorized to go into this resource because it does link to the full text. So they want to make sure that it's uh, WRHA people that are accessing it. So your username is usually your first initial last name WRHA and then your password. If you've forgotten your password, you can contact us and you should know how to do that. It's on our main page under the contact information. Just call us and we can reset the password for you. If for some reason you don't have a login and you, you've never received one and you're not sure if you are eligible for one, you can go on our main page as well and under Get Access, take a look there because it, it outlines who's eligible for service and who to contact or arrange for service on there. So once you put that information, you log in, you get to the PubMed page. Hearts not included on the no, real website. That's true. There's no hearts on the real one. But I just uh, wanted to point out a few items there. Uh, besides this uh, webinar as a resource, uh, PubMed offers several quick start guides as well as several tutorials. They're usually like two or three minutes long and they'll be on a very specific aspect of PubMed. So they're very short and brief to watch and you can use that as a tool. Uh, off to the right there, this is a mesh database, which we'll be using in an example. And hopefully at the end of the webinar, I'll have time to go into more detail as to what the mesh database is. That stands for medical subject headings. But in the middle there, we have single citation matcher. And that's one of the first resources that I'd like to explain to you on how to use. So how often have you been at a conference and you've heard of a great report that's out, but you didn't quite catch the citation or they didn't provide it all to you. Or perhaps you've come into the office and your boss has said, did you see that great report in the Globe and Mail? And you're going, uh, no, I didn't. Or, or I did, did, but then you rushed to your office and try to find it. Or even you've looked at a reference list and it's not correct. <laughs> yes, yeah. So this little tool here lets you find something very quickly with a few details. So for instance, uh, if uh, someone said, oh, in the Globe and Mail today, August 7th, 2018, uh, there's a report linking delayed hip surgeries and death. And uh, they indicate that it was in the CMAJ journal. With those few details, you can come here, you can enter the journal title in full, or just uh, the proper abbreviation, which is CMAJ. We don't know the full details of the volume issue, but we do know the year, it's obviously 2018. And at the bottom there, title words. Well, we don't know the exact title, but let's hope that hip surgery is in there. So I put that much detail in, and at the top of the page there, you can see the search string, and it found two results, and the first one is the item that we want. So we can continue searching in PubMed here because up at the top there, that is the search bar for PubMed, but I'd like to show you how you get to the main page. So going back up to the main screen in the uh, left-hand side there, the arrow is showing, uh, pointing to pubmed.gov. Clicking on that always brings you back to the right-hand side there, which is the main page of PubMed. So let's try a basic keyword search heart attack. Uh, I've put in the phrase heart attack and it's come up with 2,400 plus searches. Yes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of searches. Numbers. Number, <laughs> numbers, yeah. Um, I'd like to point out uh, before I go too far into explaining how we got that many hits, just take a look at this page here a little bit, orientate you to it. Uh, across the top there, this uh, is showing the summary format of the articles, and if you want to change that, you just go up to the top there, 
uh, where you see format summary, you can click down that box and put it to abstract view or full text or a full record. Uh, if you want to resort the list, you can do that by title, author, or publication date. It's showing automatically 20 per page. If you wanted to, you could go up to 200 per page. On the left-hand side, we're gonna talk about those in a few minutes. Those are some filters that we can use. But why did we get so many hits? The word heart attack in PubMed is mapped. And if you go down the, uh, on that page, when you do your search, if you just look down on the right-hand side, a little down the page, you'll find this search detail, which I have inserted there. And PubMed is actually mapping the phrase heart attack. Uh, what it's done is it's mapped it to the mesh term. So it's searching for it as a mesh term, myocardial infarction. It's searched for those two words independently and then as a phrase. And then it's done the same thing for heart attack. It's searched for the word heart and attack separately and the phrase heart attack. So that's why you're getting so many hits. Uh, as I said, the filters on the left-hand side there are one way to limit this search. So those are the most common ones on the right there. Uh, article types, review is a good way to limit to some higher quality evidence. Under customize, under article types, if you click on that, you can get access to several more options like randomized controlled trial, systematic review, or guideline. Text availability might be important to you because by clicking on free full text, we'll get you quick access to full text that's available free through the publishers. But bear in mind that you're not looking at all the evidence then and maybe not the best evidence. Publication date is another good one to use. You've got some standard years there, but if you want a custom range, you could put in three years, you could put in 2015 to 2018. Because there's veterinary information in PubMed, you might want to limit to humans if it's appropriate. Uh, but there are also many other additional uh, filters and at the bottom there you can click on show additional filters. It's a two-step process. First you're going to click on the filters that you want to show in the sidebar. So let's for example pick subjects and journals and then you click on show. That actually puts them into the sidebar and then you can select the items that you want to filter. And this works for not just the like it works for all different sorts of filters, including article types. So if you go in and select, oh, I want to see guidelines and then select it in there, you have to select it again on the second, on the main page once you've already done that, yeah. which always seems a little counterintuitive to me. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. it's a two-step process. Yeah. So uh, in order to uh, narrow this search, I decided to select review five years English. And in this case, I had to go in and pull it up and then select it. And history of medicine, which is under subject when, I, when you go under customize. Applying those brought it down to a lovely 23. And as you can see on the left hand side, the ones that I selected, you simply click on them, it check marks them off. If you wanted to deselect any of them, just click them again and the result numbers will change. Uh, also, you can, there's a clear all button on the right hand side there. Uh, you can clear all the filters. That's important to do if you're going on to a brand new search because these filters will remain and uh, change the results of your next search, which you can easily take off if you realize that you've left them off. So, Let's say while doing this search, I realized, oh, I could have searched on heart attacks as well, the plural of attack. But there's several articles here that I'm very interested in keeping. How do I manage this? The best thing to do is to send the items that you're interested in to a clipboard to save them. So let's, for instance, select number one and number four on this page. They're checked off here. And then I simply go up to the right-hand side there. There's a send to drop-down box. I've selected clipboard and add to clipboard. I, once I click on add to clipboard in the background image there, it indicates in your search that the two items were saved to the clipboard. And there's also a little reminder there that what you put into the clipboard is good for eight hours. Uh, it'll, it'll disappear after eight hours of inactivity. So eventually you need to do something with this. 
but it's great because now I can continue on and do another search and then I can save a few more to the clipboard and continue on like that. So once I'm finished doing executing all my searches and I want to get to the clipboard items, I just go up to the right hand side there in the background where the arrow is and click on the clipboard to items and that brings me to the foreground picture which indicates that I have two items, or if I had done more searches, maybe 10 items, and I can review them and individually remove the items from clipboard under each citation. But the things that we can do with this here to save them is to, uh, you can have a choice. You can send it to file and save it on your desktop or on your drive. Uh, you can email the results to yourself or you can send it to a citation manager if you're doing a, going to be going on to other databases and searching. Uh, citation managers would be something like EndNote, Zotero, or Mendeley. Uh, and we'll happily tell you about them if you want. Just yes. contact us. That would be another webinar. Yeah, eventually. Yes. So I'll turn it over to Maureen for All a right. few more tips. So one of the things, if you've ever searched PubMed, sometimes it seems like it doesn't really make sense and maybe you've turned into this cartoon gentleman here being like, what is happening? I don't understand because you did a search for a heart attack and it showed you 240,000, hits. But then you put in heart attack with the little asterisk, so truncation, and that's giving you uh, 5,000, 107 hits, which is considerably less, but it should be looking for heart attack and heart attacks and and heart, heart attack and heart attacks and and so on and so forth. Um, and then you, if you put it in quotes, heart attack, you get 4,042 hits. And so these numbers don't always they aren't always what you expect them to be. So what's happening here is that when you've when you've got basic heart attack, what it's looking for is anything that has both the words heart and the words attack in it. So it's looking for heart and attack in one document, and it doesn't really matter where it is in the document when you've put it in like that. When you search for heart attack in quotation marks, it's looking for only that phrase, heart attack. And then when you put it heart attack with a little asterisk, there are sort of secret quotation marks. So it's behaving like, like it's in quotation marks, like it's looking for a phrase, but it's also giving you more options than just the single phrase in, in quotation marks. So that's why you've got this thing that doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so it's always good to look at that little search box down at the bottom of the yeah. search page to see how PubMed has mapped it. Yeah. And so when you're doing the, you remember from Angela's previous slides, it had, you know, when you're looking for heart attack because it's mapped, it's looking for myocardial infarction and myocardial and infarction and, 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 and all this list of terms that you didn't actually put in. But when it's in quotation marks, it's only looking for that phrase, not any of that other extra stuff that you're asking for. Likewise, heart attack with the truncation is looking for that phrase with, you know, S on the end, with ED on the end, with anything that would come after that little asterisk. So that's how that works. That's why it's sometimes confusing. And uh, we've briefly talked about the idea of and and or. You've heard us saying that a lot. These are called Boolean operators. And I'll get into Boolean operators here and now. So what you have is the two main ones are and and or. There's also not, which is just an exclusion one. Um, and it's generally not a good idea to include not because it often removes things that you don't intend it to remove. So for and and or, you've got and, and and is it must, whatever you're looking at must contain these two things, both of them together. So if you're looking for heart attack, heart and attack, it's looking for the word heart and the word attack. If you use or, it's looking for both either heart or attack. So your document could have only one of those words and it would include all of them. So you could have something about, um, heart surgery and something about bear attacks, you know, 
either of those would show up in an or search, but not an and search, unless the bear attacking you is giving you a heart attack, which is, you know, reasonable, I feel. <laughs> um, so in general, what you're using or for is synonyms, alternate spellings, you know, you've got the Canadian version with the U and the American version without the U of a lot of spellings, um, or plural versions or anything like that. And is for distinct concepts and that you need to search for them together. So we're going to go through an example here and we're going to say, how do we find in PubMed, how do we find guidelines for the use of melatonin for sleep disorders? And so you can see there just under that question, what a search for that might look like. You've got sleep disorder truncated. So that would be sleep disorders, sleep disordered, or sleep-wake disorders mesh, which is the mesh terms, which we've been talking about a little bit and which I will get into in more detail on the next slide. And then you've got, so those two concepts are put in brackets, brackets. <laughs> um, sorry, where's the camera? I don't know. Um, so you've got sleep disorder and sleep-wake, like, or sleep-wake disorders within one thing. And so that's looking for things that either have sleep disorder as keywords or something that falls into the sleep-wake disorder mesh term. And then you've got another set of brackets with ORs for melatonin and the melatonin mesh term. And then you're combining those with an AND. So it's looking for, you know, you could have any combination that you could have sleep disorder and melatonin, the keyword, or you could have sleep disorder and melatonin, the mesh term. And the brackets, all those brackets allow that to, to function properly. Um, but we'll show you how to do it where you don't have to be putting in all those brackets yourself because that can, there's nothing like an unclosed bracket to ruin a search string. So fortunately, PubMed does it for you. <laughs> um, so, in terms of the keyword searching, we've gone over some of that already. So here's what a keyword search for melatonin would look like. You just type in melatonin in the search bar at the top there, and you get, you know, 24,004 hits. Um, over on the other side, you do sleep disorder with the, the little truncation, which will look for sleep disorders, sleep disordered, sleep disorderly, if that was a thing that was a term that exists, but it's not. Um, but it would look for it. Um, and so then you get, you know, 23,310 results. So we've already covered how to do that. What about those mesh terms? What are they and where do they come from? So uh, Angela mentioned that mesh stood for medical subject headings. Um, and what it is basically is a controlled set of terms that are assigned to books, to articles that are of a relevant topic. So if you've written a book about heart attacks, you would have the mesh term myocardial infarction assigned to it, even if for some reason in a book about heart attacks, you didn't use that term. Um, and these are curated by either the publishers or by experts yes. in the field, depending on where the source is coming mm -hmm. from. Um, so that's what that is. And, and mesh terms, tend to be very good at catching relevant information that you might not catch with a keyword search. Um, and it tends to remove a lot of excess noise in your searches as well, if you're using them. So in terms of, oh no. So hopefully this talking in the background isn't something you can hear, but we'll speak up a little bit more just in case. Um, so in terms of how to get to the mesh database to find out what is a good mesh term for you to be using. Again, go to the pubmed.gov logo at the top there, click on it, and then scroll down. You can see the second arrow on the second box here is pointing under more resources to mesh database. So you'd click on that, and that will take you to something that looks like this. And you'll see there's a little drop down with mesh. You put in the term you're looking for, melatonin in this case, and then it'll provide you with a list of 15 results. And you can see melatonin, receptor melatonin MT2, receptor melatonin MT1. Well, the one you want is melatonin, and it gives you a little definition of, of what that term refers to. So we know that's what we need, but we know we don't want, well, a melatonin, melatonin receptor subtype 
that's not something we want. So then you go over to the right hand side and you press add to search builder. And you can see in the PubMed search builder, it'll come up with melatonin in quotes and then square brackets mesh. And that indicates that it's a mesh term. So do that, put it into the search builder. Then do the same thing for your second term or however many terms you want to look for. Sleep disorder in this case, it points you towards sleep-wake disorders. Um, so you check the little box next to sleep-wake disorders because it's what you want. You can check more than one if you want. We didn't in this example, but maybe dysomnias is a good one for you as well. Maybe that's something that you would want to include in your search. So you could check both of them and press add to search builder. And again, you see sleep-wake disorders and quotes, mesh terms. And, and you can see that sleep-wake disorders is a different term than maybe you would have assumed with, uh, with sleep disorder. So you can't just assume that this is what the mesh term is going to be because sometimes it's different than what you're looking for. So once you've done this, um, so... You've got four searches you've done. Yeah. Where are yeah. they? So if you're in the, at the top, you can, you can see what's coming up with the mesh term search um, here. And we've got, you know, 80,010. Um, but you've done these, these four different searches. You haven't combined them in any way yet. But if you click on advanced, which is just under the search bar at the top, it'll show you your search history here. So you can see that you did a search for melatonin, a search for sleep disorder, a search for melatonin mesh term, and a search for sleep-wake disorders mesh term. Um, if you, so now, now you want to build your, your different ors. So put your like terms together. So melatonin and melatonin mesh are things that are similar. They're basically the same idea. You're, it's your melatonin concept. So if you press add, for each one of those, it'll add them to the search fields up above. So you can see here, you've got melatonin, melatonin mesh, and then the default in that orange circle is set to and. But here you want it to be or, because you're comfortable with anything that's coming up in melatonin mesh, or with anything that's coming up with the melatonin keyword search. So you say melatonin or melatonin mesh, and then you press search. And melatonin Keyword could be from the title, the abstract, the full text. Yeah, yeah. And then you do the same thing. So now you look at your search history and you can see that previous search you've just done, melatonin or melatonin mesh. And then in your sleep history, you want to do, or your search history, you want to do the same thing for sleep disorders. So you add the sleep disorder and the sleep-wake disorder from mesh. And you put them together, you get the sleep disorder or sleep-wake disorders, again, make sure that you select it to or, not and, um, because otherwise it will only look for things that have both sleep disorder keywords and have the sleep-wake disorder mesh, which would reduce your number of results instead of expanding them. So you've got that. And then you go in here, and back to advanced search, and so now you want to combine your melatonin concept and your sleep-wake disorder concept. So you put these together with an and. So you click on both of them with add, and then this time you leave that little box alone. So it just says and, and then you get melatonin or melatonin and sleep disorder or sleep-wake disorders. And then you've, you've got your results there, and you're getting only 2,223. That's not the end of it. Of course, we were interested in looking for guidelines. Um, and even though 2,223 is less than the 80,000 or whatever you were getting for each one of those items, it's still more than you're going to want to scroll through. Um, so you go to the side, you do what Angela talked about earlier, customize, find practice guidelines, add practice guidelines and then click on it so it appears there like this and you can see now we have eight uh, guidelines which is a much more reasonable number to filter through. Um, Angela is going to talk briefly if you wanted number two how would you go about getting that um, but before I pass it off to Angela I know that boolean can sometimes be a place where people get lost as can mesh um, so if you have any questions, if we haven't been clear, 
uh, please feel free to respond in the chat box. Um, since typing takes time, though, I will pass it off to Angela. Okay. So, how, how are we doing for time as well? We are at. Oh, okay, go fast. Oh, go fast. Because okay. we are okay. at the end of our time. Wow. Sorry about that. Okay, so if we want that second item there, we click on the item. That brings up the abstract. Uh, and here off to the right, you can see that you actually have two full free text offerings. But let's pretend in this case, there are no such offerings there from the publisher you'd have to pay. What you're going to do is check library access and you're going to have to sign in again. Uh, once you sign in, the yellow bar will go away and your name will be in the top right hand corner. You're signing in again so that you see all the ordering options and it allows or all the full text options and also it allows you to order if it's not available. So let's pretend we signed in and the yellow bar is gone. Uh, in this case, you're lucky because this one has a WRHA in front of it. So that means that you can click on that and get the full text. Let's pretend again that none of these options have it. What you're gonna do is scroll down a little bit under availability request and you're gonna order sources. Once you click on that, you get a pre-populated, it's very easy, it'll populate all the information with the article information, it will provide your delivery address, your email, so it's important that we have your correct email on file. Uh, you can actually change it in that bar if it's incorrect, but it doesn't change your file. Uh, you click on the bottom there where the arrow is, please acknowledge, and then you can hit the submit button, which is hidden. And that uh, will send it off to us and we can get the article for you. Uh, um, so we've reached the end of our 30 minute whatever, uh, like our 30 minute allotted time. Um, but for anybody who wants to learn more about mesh terms, we'll stay on the line and keep doing this. Likewise, if you have any questions at this point and you need to head out, um, ask them now and we'll answer them. But we will be quickly going through this mesh uh, yeah. closer look yeah. and uh, we'll try to be brief. Yeah, and it's not very long and uh, Maureen already covered some of it. So it's medical subject headings. It's a controlled vocabulary list. People actually sit down and actually apply the mesh vocabulary, vocabulary to the articles. Uh, this is what it looks like. If you scroll down, once you pull up the abstract article uh, version, you will scroll down and you actually see the mesh terms that are assigned to the article. Uh, let's say we want to take a closer look at the sleep-wake disorders. So you click on that, and this is what comes up. You've got the scope note, which is the little description that helps you decide if it's the one you want. You have a whole bunch of subheadings that you can use to narrow the search. For instance, you could pick drug therapy. You've got two options further down. You could restrict to major topics. So if I was to select those two, that's what the search string would look like. The other box, do not include mesh items found below this term in the mesh hierarchy. Remember that, because we're going to talk about it in a minute. Below that are some entry terms. So anything you type in looking for uh, this thing, like we did sleep disorder, brings you to the term that's preferred, which is sleep-wake disorders. And I do just want to quickly add that searching for something as a major topic means it's the main topic of yeah. the article. Yeah. Uh, so broader term, uh, so this scrolling down, this is the hierarchy that that second box was talking about. So sleep wake is here. Anything above that is a broader term. Anything below, indented below it is a narrower term. Uh, if my results were not with sleep wake disorders were so minimal that I need, I could go to a, a broader search term and perhaps get more results. Or uh, conversely, if I get too many hits with sleep wake disorders, I could look to see what's under it and perhaps get a more specific, narrower term to search on. What's important to know about PubMed is it automatically explodes. So if you pick sleep-wake disorders, the reason you get so many hits is it's also searching for all those narrower terms. So if you recall, I told you to remember that other box. If you don't want it to do that, you have to click that box. So, for instance, let's just see what the difference is. So, if I pick uh, sleep wake disorders therapy major, I get 18,000 over 18,000 hits. And if I was went back and selected no explode, 
I end up with 1,400 hits. So that in a nutshell is MASH, it was very quick. There are great tutorials that you can review. You can come back and review this. You can contact us if you have any questions. Hopefully we've given you an idea of how to uh, narrow or broaden your search and some of the special features about PubMed. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. We'll stick around for a little bit to answer any questions, but this is the end of the webinar. And for those of you who are still with us, thanks for sticking around as we went five minutes over. Sorry about that. <laughs> so thanks very much and have a great day. Yeah, you too. And we'll just mute ourselves um, while we wait for questions. Yes. Oh, a survey will be going out too. Yes, yes. So, and just a reminder, the survey will be going out. We'll be sending you the slides and we'll be sending you a link to the, the um, recording of the video. So, thank you. Thank you. Bye.